As our Bibles are open this morning to the book of the Psalms, I love the Psalms, don't you? The 39th Psalm, we'll read together. This is a poetic book and probably the most spiritual and practical books, I would say, in the entire Bible. The Psalms, as we think about the Psalms, is actually a Hebrew hymn book. And they cover a whole realm of items, of life itself, of human experiences, from one end to the other. And as you study the Psalms, you encounter every emotion of the human heart. Love, hate, joy, sorrow, hope, fear, peace, strife, faith, despair. And out of the 150 Psalms that we have recorded, David is the writer of almost half, 73 of these Psalms, including this psalm that we're reading through today. As we look at this psalm, I want you to think about this thought that David is going through a time of discouragement in his own life. A time of despair. As we come to this text, in his despondency, he pins this psalm, even though he's overwhelmed and disturbed with life itself and things are all upside down. David, like many of us, has found himself looking at his problems rather than trusting the Lord. David is trying to figure out the answer and try to solve these items on his own, like many of us. In addition to all that he's going through, David gets his eyes off of the Lord And he's looking around of the wicked. And even in his despair, it seems as if that the wicked who never acknowledge God are prospering. Never having a care in life. Could that be you? Could we find ourselves getting our eyes off of what God is doing in our trials and looking at the world living as if they have the world by the tail on a downhill swing and never thinking, never acknowledging God. David is on a roll complaining to God. But right in the midst of this, he stops. He refrains. He meditates. Then he begins to evaluate his own life. Solomon the wisest man in all the Bible tells us in Ecclesiastes 3 7, and there's a time to keep silence and a time to speak. David today is thinking, evaluating. And this 39th Psalm, as we read together, down through verse number 8. I said, I will take heed to my ways, that I sin not with my tongue. I will keep my mouth with a bridle while the wicked is before me. I was dumb with silence. I held my peace even from good, and my sorrow was stirred. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue, Lord, make me to know mine end and the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. Behold, thou hast made my days as a hand breath, and my age is nothing before thee. Verily, every man at his best state is altogether vanity. Selah. Surely every man walketh in a way shown. Surely they are disquieted in vain. He heapeth up riches and knoweth not who shall gather them. And now, Lord, what wait I for? My hope is in Thee. Deliver me from my transgressions. Make me not to reproach, be not the reproach of the foolish. Make me not the reproach 
of the foolish. As David is writing this, I, know, I want you to note what he says in verse number 3 and call to your attention this unusual phrase when he says, While I was musing, the fire burned. What does this word musing mean? Musing means to think, to ponder, to contemplate, to consider, to evaluate. And we may not be so familiar with this word muse. But in this 21st century, we are very familiar with the word amuse. The letter A negates the root word here, muse. And points to something that is distracting or diverting. There are many that are listening to me today, whether in this auditorium or by radio or live stream, that have found yourself so concerned with what's going on on the outside that we've got our eyes off of the Lord. We find ourselves trying to get through another day in some way, and so we try to find something to take place of what's going on in our life and we turn to some attraction to some game to some movie to some song to some activity something that will amuse us someone that will get our mind off of all that's going on in our flesh we feel so weak naturally and a constant need to be entertained. And today's society, truthfully, has a deep obsession on being abused. And think nothing about spiritual things, nothing about eternity, and nothing about others. The more David kept silent, the more sorrow was stirred. The psalmist now finally confesses, notice when he says, my heart was hot within me. He reminds us of the two disciples, recall, after the Lord Jesus Christ had resurrected from the grave. And unknowingly, they were actually walking with the risen Savior. And they said in Luke 24, verse 32, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us? For Jeremiah the prophet under persecution said, I will not make mention of him nor speak his name, but his word was in my heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. Jeremiah 20 and verse 9. But David says, my heart was hot within me while I was musing. The fire burned. Then spake I with my tongue. And he asked God to the God of heaven, to show him three things he requests, three important things, if you'll notice in verse number four. After David had looked all around in his discouragement and despair, he asked this, Lord, help me to know mine end. In the measure of my days, what it is, that I may know how frail I am. If you underscore for this morning's message in verse 3, while I was musing, and may the Lord add His blessing to our study. He says, first of all, Lord, make me to know mine end. He wanted to know, but when is it coming? The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, And is it appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. Psalm 89 in verse 48 says, What man is he that liveth and shall not see death? Shall he deliver his soul from the hand of the grave? Selah. We all have an appointment. 
The truth of it is, if I knew, as David says, Lord, help me to know mine end. If I knew when my end would be, would it change me today? Truthfully, as one man once said, if I knew where I was going to die, I'd never go there. <laughs> we all want to live forever. We all want to enjoy life as long as we possibly can. But David is asking the question, Lord, help me to know mine end. When shall I see death? He asked in Psalm 89. Luke chapter 12, if you'd like to turn with me. You'll find here the rich young farmer. The Bible says in Luke 12 verse 17 that the rich man thought within himself, what shall I do? He looked around at all of his barns and he had plenty. As a matter of fact, he had more crop than he had barns or places to store. So he asked the question, what shall I do? And then he immediately comes to a conclusion with the decision and he says, this will I do. I'll pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And then he says this, and I will say to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. There are so many people that are just like this man. He felt like, as a good steward, he was going to take care of his crop, and there's nothing wrong with that in planning ahead, and nothing wrong with that. But he said, I'm just going to sit back and eat, drink, and be merry. But I want you to notice in verse number 20 of Luke 12 that God calls time on this man, and he says, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He had 12 hours to live. And then the Lord asked a question, then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Someone asked the question, how much do you think he left behind? And the other person answered, all of it. And that's the truth. All that you have, you're going to leave behind. But the man thought he had plenty of time. But the Lord said, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. He had 12 hours to live. I may not know my end as far as life is concerned. I may not know when my last day is. But I want you to know this morning without any hesitation whatsoever, I can tell you I know my destiny. I know where I'm going. I trust you can say the same. I do not know when that day will come, but I do know my destiny. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 35, For whoso findeth me, he says, findeth life, and shall obtain favor of the Lord. There are many people that are searching for life today. They're trying to figure it all out and there could be some even in this room or under the sound of my voice that as a Christian you found yourself in such despair and so distraught that you're thinking there's surely more to life than this. There's more that I need to get. There's more that I need to gain. But I want you to know you'll never be satisfied if you leave God out. And one day this life will end. If you do not know Christ as your Savior and you're seeking the answer, keep in mind John 3.15 reminds us that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. 1 John 2.25 says, and this is the promise that He's promised us, even eternal life. So David asked these three questions, but first he asked, Lord, help me to know mine end. He had an appointment here with death. As a Christian, we realize that all of us have an appearance before God. One day, we're going to stand before Him. And I want to hear Him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things, enter now into the joys of the Lord, and I'll make you ruler over many things. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.10, 
For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things that done, things done in this body or his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. And the Bible reminds us, Romans 4, 12, 14, 12, so then every one of us will give an, ass- an account of himself. The psalmist says in Psalm 143 in verse 10, as we think about life and we think about where we're going, teach me to do thy will for thou art my God. Teach me to do thy will. Look, the greatest thing that we can ask God for now is say, Lord, just help me to be obedient to your will. Help me to surrender myself to you to be used by you. You see, we can all make a difference in someone else's life. We all have friends. We all have family. Well, I guess some of you folks over there do have friends. Troy, you have a couple friends. We all have friends. Sure you do. Debbie has friends, so they're your friends. We, we all have friends and we all have family. We all have people that we have influence on and people that will listen to you, truthfully, more than they will a preacher. They may never darken these doors, but we're to be a witness to them. You indeed may be the only Bible, the only Bible that people would read. And may we understand. One day I'm going to stand before the Lord. And so David said, Lord, help me to know mine end. Ecclesiastes reminds us again that death's coming to all of us. But while we're in this journey, Paul writes to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 5, 17, Be not wise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. You ought to mark that scripture down, Ephesians 5, 17. Be not wise, unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Be not drunk with wine which, wine in which is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. It's about being under the control of the Spirit of God. That's where it begins as we yield ourselves to Him and understanding what the will of the Lord is. May I say to us all today, why don't we just muse? Don't snooze now. Muse on your destination. Muse on your destination. Secondly, notice what he says in our text. In this passage of Scripture, he says, Lord, make me to know mine end. I've underscored the word end. And then he says, and the measure of my days. The measure of my days, meaning that I want to get the most out of my life. There's no question about it. But may I say, as you read this passage of Scripture, you realize that all of us just have a time. Turn with with me, please, to the book of James for just a moment. Hold your place there. In the Psalms, James chapter number 4. And I want you to notice what the writer says under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. James chapter 4 and verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow, we'll go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. There's nothing wrong with going to the city. There's nothing wrong with buying. There's nothing wrong with selling and even making a little profit. There's nothing wrong with getting ahead in life as long as we do it honestly and follow the principles that God has given us. But notice what he says in verse 14. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. He then says in verse 15, for that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. If the Lord will. It's about being obedient to the Lord and being in His perfect will in each of our lives. David says, Lord, make me to know the measure of my days. As you read this text, we also realize when he's talking about the measure of my days or the quantity. Do you measure your life by the quantity? Speaking again of the number of days in which you live. And Job says, For we are but of yesterday and know nothing because our days upon the earth are shadow. Hosea 10.13 reminds us it is time to seek the Lord. And do you measure your days by quantity? 
of how much you can get out of that day or how many days you're going to live as you muse on your days. Should we not think about the quality of our days? Would you write this number down? A number, 78.5. 78.5. Now that 78.5 is talking about the number of years that the average man in America lives. The average man lives. I hope I'm not just average, but 78.5. Ladies, I do not have your number in front of me, but I know it's a little higher than the 78.5. I'm not sure why ladies live longer on an average than men do, but that's the case. And so I began to calculate. As I reminded of Moses when he says, so teach us to number our days. So I'm going to number my days. And when I think about the average man lives 78.5 years, this, write it down, 28,672 days. 28,672 days. At 70 and a half almost, that means I have 2,922 days left, possibly. Less than 3,000 days. So on this side, should I not be looking a little closer at what I'm going to do with all of those days? And I'm just sharing with you from my heart this morning that I'm at least thinking about it. But you know what? The Lord may not allow me to make the rest of this day. Then again, He may allow me to be as old as some of you in this room. You know, I see some of you are pushing 100. Bill, how, how, you're close to that, aren't you? Going close to 100. And so maybe the Lord will allow me to, uh, to live those long days. I think about Sister Bailey that actually passed away here during COVID at the beginning of COVID. And she was looking forward to her 100th birthday, and we celebrated her birthday turning 100 months beforehand, ironically. That was just the Lord. And then she passed away at 99. But I, I think about things that all of us have in our heart and our mind. But it's not about the quantity of these days. It's about the measure here by the quality. When David writes, he says again that we need to think about the days that are before us as he's writing this text. But Moses is the writer of Psalm 90. And Moses, as he talks about the brevity of life itself, as you read that, the children of Israel coming out of bondage were disobedient, would not go into the promised land because they lacked the faith. And each one of those under the age of 21, over the age of 21 rather, began to perish except for two, Joshua and Caleb, right? They all died. And Moses is writing about the brevity of life in Psalm 90. And he comes down to verse number 12 and he says, So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Job says, choose you this day. Or Joshua says, choose you this day as whom you will serve. And then he says, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. How am I going to get a quality life? It's by allowing God not to be first place, but to be your life. And again, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Matthew 6.33 says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. This is how you measure by the quality of our life. The Apostle Paul, it's interesting, writing from a prison jail cell the last days of his life, that as he writes in Philippians 3.10, he says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. He said, I want to get to know him better. I want to know him intimately. Psalm 100 says, serve the Lord with gladness. And then he says, and come before the Lord Come before His presence with singing. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Philippians reminds us again of drawing closer to the Lord, being sensitive of the time that we're going to pass. The Psalms remind us over and over again, 118 verse 24, This is the day that the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. As she sang this song a little while ago, I thought of this verse 
from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he what? Shall direct thy paths. David says, Lord, not only make me to know mine end, but make me to know the measure of my days. And how do you find that? By claiming those seven verses that I just gave you, that as we would understand that it all starts by giving myself completely to the Lord and trusting God in every area of my life and knowing that God is in charge. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. Notice these three things again in Psalm 39. Lord, make me to know my end. Lord, make me to know the measure of my days. And then notice the last part when he says, Lord, make me to know how frail I am. We're all finite, meaning that we're limited. We all have areas, no doubt, of, that would qualify us for so many things in position. But even at best, all of us are nothing but flesh. And our minds finite. God is omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. God is not only all-knowing, all-power, but may I say, He's everywhere. We cannot compare with that. And the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth, encouraging them in the Lord, he says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction is but for a moment worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. If I'm talking about living a life that's pleasing to the Lord, a life again that I want to be not only used by God, but an example to others, but I also want to enjoy this journey, then maybe I need to stop. Yes, we all need to stop. And David writes... While I was musing, began burning within his own heart. While he's concentrating, while he's contemplating, while he's communicating with God, he says, Lord, I have three requests. Help me to know my end. Make me to know the measure of my days. Knowing again that we're nothing but dust. The Bible reminds us in Psalm 103, He remembered that we're dust. He knoweth our frame. He remembered that we're dust. Genesis 2, 7, And the Lord God formed man, the Bible says, from the dust of the ground. And He breathed in the man's nostrils the breath of life, and he became a living soul. We came from dust, we're going back from dust. Solomon says, Then dust shall return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit shall return unto God who gave it. Now, what are we saying here? Lord, help me to know my end. It's about muse. It's about musing on your dependent life. No man is prepared to live until he first is prepared to die. You'll not enjoy the journey. You'll not enjoy life if you do not know Christ as your Savior. And knowing that it's joy unspeakable and what? Full of glory. May I say, as David says, while I was musing. While I was musing about what? His destination. While I was musing about his days. And then he says, and how frail I am that his dependence is totally upon the Lord. How do we get through a day? How do we face life? Would you write these down, these five things? First of all, exalt Christ in all that we do. Exalt Christ in all that we do. Exercise your faith in the Lord as you trust Him completely. Express the need to others, how they need to come to know Christ. May we exceed the norm in being the Christian that we need to be. And you know what's so important every day of our life? We serve God by serving our fellow man. 
about exhorting one another daily. That's what the Bible says. Exalt Christ. Exercise your faith. Trust in Him. Express the need to others. Exceed the norm. And exhort one another daily. There's a preacher in the 1800s. He was born 1860. He died in the early 30s, 1931. He's a British missionary that no doubt shaped many of the things in fundamentalism that we cling to today. Now, the man's name is C.T. Studd. He writes this poem. Maybe you've heard it before. I came across it again the other day. It's entitled, Only One Life. Two little lines I heard one, one day, traveling along life's busy way, bringing conviction to my heart and from my mind would not depart. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, yes, only one. Soon will its fleeting hours be done. Then, in that day, my Lord to meet and stand before the judgment seat. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, the still small voice, gently pleads for a better choice. Bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life, a few brief years, each with its burdens, hopes, and fears. Each with its clays I must fulfill, living for self or in His will. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. With this bright world would tempt me sore, when Satan would a victory score, when self would seek to have its way, then help me, Lord, with joy to say, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Give me, Father, a purpose deep. In joy or sorrow, thy word to keep. Faithful and true, whate'er the strife, pleasing thee in my daily life. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Oh, let my love forever fervor burn, and from the world now let me turn. Living for thee and thee alone, bringing thee pleasure on thy throne. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. Only one life? Yes, only one. Now let me say, thy will be done. And when at last I hear the call, I know I'll say, twas worth it all. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. We've often quoted just that one phrase, only what's done for Christ will last. But we hear in that poem, no doubt, what God desires from each of us, to live every day, every day, knowing that this could be the day. If we knew it was, would we live differently? 